Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nuance Ho YouTube channel. Sometimes I go by Nuance Ho, sometimes I go by Cara Burrell. Sometimes if you want to get my attention, you just leave 50 nose emojis on my Instagram and I'm at your beck and call. So the inspiration for this video is about logical fallacies that are used within the Mormon Church, within the context of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I was a member of the church for 29 years of my life. Um, I really enjoyed my time in the church. Um, I didn't leave because I had a bad time. <laughs> I left because it turned out that it wasn't a true thing. And the evidence that I thought was good evidence, I don't think is good evidence anymore. And the reasons, the conjecture that I made, the allowances that I made, I didn't came to believe those are not good reasons anymore. Um, I wasn't planning on making this video today, uh, but I was uh, doing some research for another video that I'm making. Uh, another like four videos that I have in the process of making. Um, I was typing it out here at my friend Samantha Shelley's house, who does Up on the Shelf, who's amazing, and her arguments were always so amazing. Her and Tanner Gilliland do an amazing job over on Up on the Shelf. Their arguments made a lot of sense to me when I was trying to deconstruct. First of all, just a plug to Samantha. She's over there with her headphones in, so I don't have to cringe every time I know that she's overhearing me make a video in her boyfriend's sewing room. So another plug for winemomjared.com. So yeah, I'm recording in Samantha's apartment today. Uh, this video is actually going to be pretty quick. It was pretty easy to put together for me. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, just go over what logical fallacies are, why people use them, and specifically in the Mormon context, I was able just to think of a lot of videos I've seen, especially recently, uh, where these fallacious arguments are employed in a way that I would say uh, pacify believers and give them allowances to operate within to continue believing the things that they want to believe are advantageous for them to believe and are advantageous for other people to believe without understanding the flaws in their argument. So I've always wanted a video like this to be made by somebody and if the one like this exists please link me <laughs> down below. So I have a lot of stuff I want to get through and I want to get through it quick. Let's see how many logical fallacies that we can get into. So first and foremost let me just say all over the place, all over the world. A lot of arguments can be made. Things can be said. Pacification is possible. I thought I had good reasons for why I was in the church and it turned out that I was not because a lot of arguments can be made. People can say things, can, things can be said. That This video can be for a lot of different people depending on how you view the things I'm gonna say and the clips I'm gonna show. This video is for people in the LDS church who are interested in forming logically sound arguments for their dedication to the LDS Church to maybe be better understood, like to, maybe to better understand what pitfalls to avoid to be taken more seriously. And then this video is also for members of the LDS Church who know that there are things that they don't like and the arguments given to pacify them to kind of deny their own instincts that something isn't quite right here, uh, but they can't put their their finger on it yet. They can't really, really understand. Just giving some clear examples of uh, faulty logic. And then this video is also for ex-members of the LDS Church, ex-Mormons, who they also know something is wrong here in Mormon apologetics land, and that the arguments in favor of the church being true, uh, they sure make God out to be someone who wants you to subvert all your logic and rely on faith, and rely on faith in place of reason. This moment in which the faith that I was asked to have, yeah, that would be one thing, but it's at the cost of discounting evidence that the thing is not true and the cost of discounting my better judgment and what makes sense for who I think God is, what kind of church he runs, discounting your better judgment on what makes sense, what is a rational conclusion, given the evidence against it, when all of the excuses are just played with these logical fallacies. Then lastly, 10,000 foot view here is this video is for people of all backgrounds uh, to understand not just what a logical fallacy is in the context of the Mormon church, but how people of all backgrounds use these weaselly excuses for arguments. And that might be something that you do. That might be something that you use and why it's faulty, but also how easy it is for people to fall into these logical fallacies. Because anyone, regardless of religion or cultural background, they can all use ad hominem. They can all attack the person instead of making the argument and attacking somebody's appearance rather, to, uh, rather than addressing the argument itself. Everybody can use a non sequitur. Everyone can uh, draw a conclusion that doesn't logically follow from the argument. So logical fallacies generally, um, uh, the definition is roughly, they're something that undermine the credibility of the argument that's being made and they can lead to faulty, unsound conclusions. That's bad enough. I don't have a good argument. 
don't be using things that undermine the credibility of it. And then they can also lead to a faulty, unsound conclusion to base your life off, perhaps. Uh, it's super duper important to me to discuss them, to have them kind of like laid out really clearly um, in all their various types of conversation about how we avoid them in the conversations we have, the arguments we have, the reasoning that we live our life by. So now to the why. Everything comes down to something that Samantha and Tanner from Self on the Shelf said when I was first deconstructing something that really rang true to me. So this tweet basically that says, seek to understand why people think and act the way that they do even when their beliefs slash actions are harmful. We are all products of our genetics and experiences and we can't say how we'd act in another person's shoes. Most people come from generations of unhealed trauma. So that gets into the why people may use uh, logical fallacies. First, right off the bat, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, kind of why I wanted to make this video. People are more aware that this is not good reasoning. Uh, people can use them intentionally, but more likely it's unintentional uh, just because they're not aware of where they're using them and don't fully understand how to actually construct a logical argument. And then the second one would be uh, just a straight up emotional bias. So there are people who will employ logical fallacies uh, because they are so invested in this, this position, this argument, that they're gonna use fallacious reasoning as a way to defend their beliefs because their emotions are so tight, they have so much uh, sunken cost to it as well. So then the third one would be persuasion. Then people will actually use uh, logical fallacies as a way of manipulating and persuading people into their arguments, even if those arguments are not logically sound, uh, where they would call that out on somebody else, but would they use it? It's fine, it's okay, because it's getting people on their side. And then the fourth is just straight up cognitive limitations. Our brain has biases. We can't deny that. And so there's gonna be a tendency to let that, that gate into letting new information come in and then do an overgeneralization or make a hasty judgment because anything trickling in through that, that gap is devastating to their psyche. And then I would say the fifth and final reason that people use logical fallacies have to do with laziness. Uh, it's easier just to say what comes easiest, what comes from your biases, than actually taking the effort to construct a sound logical argument. So I don't think that people who use logical fallacies are terrible people. They're not bad people. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that go into making a person act the way they do. Going back to what Sam said in this tweet. There are a lot of reasons that go into the, the reasons that people act the way they do and believe the things that they believe and rationalize and make allowances that help them to keep their brain in a comfortable place. So the first one I'm gonna start off with is the fallacy of begging the question or circular reasoning. Uh, this is a clip from, so starting off strong, <laughs> with a clip from this guy named uh, David Alexander, who is a recent convert to the LDS church, who was a long time, I think, evangelical, maybe even a pastor. I've seen him around like the uh, pro-Mormon circuit bearing his testimony. Like, isn't that great? Whenever there's a, a Hindu or a Buddhist or an evangelical or a former atheist that converts to the Mormon church, they always got to get him on their podcast. Uh, so in this video on his YouTube channel called The Early Polygamy of the Latter-day Saints, An Embarrassment or Glorious? So that got my attention. Uh, and he describes the process of going throughout his life as an evangelical who always heard that Mormons would worship a different Jesus, they have a different Bible, and then eventually reaching out to the sister missionaries, wanting to know what Mormonism was really all about, and then hearing them talk about the plan of salvation, and then him saying, oh, that clicks, that clicks so much, feeling this light, feeling like this joy and this knowledge that this is what I've been searching for my entire life. I'm not gonna be able to get to every logical fallacy because sometimes there's a Venn diagram of, of, problem, of problems of faulty logic here, but the first one that uh, jumps, off the, jumps off the screen to me is a logical fallacy when people have presuppositions that are, are baked into their argument about why something is true, why something is good, why something is beneficial, that's called begging the question. And I dug in my heels and I, I judged the prophet. I mean, I loved the fruit I was seeing. I loved the truth that I was hearing. There was light there. And this is, this is something that is a very deep thing. There was authority there. I had been on a search my entire life long for the prophetic and apostolic authority of God. I knew it had to be somewhere on the planet, okay? And I was earnestly searching for it. Couldn't find it anywhere because, of course, I wasn't looking in the right place. But when I met those sister missionaries, it blew my mind. I could tell 
They had authority that was from God. They had no business having the kind of authority they had when they spoke to me about the simplest of things. As 19-year-old young ladies, it was just nuts. I was like, God's involved in this. God is deeply involved. I don't know, I don't know exactly how to sort this out, but I knew that the authority of God was in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Circular reasoning is pretty obvious in, uh, in what David is trying to say here about why he felt like the church was true in the first place. And it's this type of fallacious reasoning where the conclusion of the argument is kind of uh, assumed within the premise. He says that I just knew that God's authority had to be somewhere on earth. I had been searching for it all my life. Um, that is an argument for the church being true that already assumes the very thing that has you have not provided any evidence for. There's no justification of that conclusion that, that there has to be authority for God on earth. So this argument assumes everything that he's trying to prove. You already believe that authority has to be contained. You're conjecturing a lot out of that to then draw a conclusion based on your own premise that there has to be authority somewhere and then conjecturing that people who speak well that that must mean that it's true. So this type of argumentation is obvious from a person who just left an evangelical tradition to go to a Mormon one that assumes a presupposition that is not universally accepted or agreed upon. There are a lot of people who say there's no such thing as God's authority. We believe in God, but he doesn't have one sole authority. The kingdom of God is within. So again, it's a circular type of reasoning here. It's like saying that we must obey the laws of the government because it is the government's job to create laws that must be obeyed. Like, we must obey God because it's our job to listen to God, because that's what he told us to do. So in what I just said, that argument assumes that the laws created by the government must be obeyed, which is the very thing that needs to be proven. By assuming that God just has authority uh, that must be obeyed, you are still uh, assuming a thing that needs to be proven. So I just think it's important to recognize when people are using this type of circular reasoning because um, it's really just falls flat on its face. Circular reasoning, something kind of that's not universally agreed upon, something that has a baked in presupposition is not just just faulty logic. It's It actually undermines the argument because it fails to provide a convincing evidence for justification because we're not on the same page with what your evidence is, what your justifications are. It's already baked into your premise and we're just, I'm just watching you go on a merry-go-round and I'm waving over here going, that's nice, but you didn't buy me a ticket. I'm not just, I'm here to ride the merry-go-round with you. I want to get on board with what you're saying, but you got to buy me a ticket first. All right, are we off to a good start? Are we having fun? The next one I want to go through is called the appeal to persecution or argumentum ad martyrdom. So you know that feeling when you are showing somebody some evidence about the church or whatever it is, and uh, they just think because there is opposition, because there is negativity about the church, that actually makes their position that the church is true and of God all the more logical and reasonable that that just makes it all the more true. Uh, but it's a fallacious reasoning and it's a really frustrating one. Uh, when somebody claims that their argument, their position must be true because it's being criticized or because it's being opposed. But then I got into the whole polygamy thing. And, uh, you know, after a few weeks and I, I, you know, I did my research. You, you know what doing research means these days? It means you Google something and then you read what's on the internet which it doesn't matter. It's like, if it has anything to do with anything righteous, what's on the internet is a bunch of accusation about how evil it is. I judged Joseph Smith. I was like, this is nuts. This is totally nuts. How can I follow somebody like this? And I dug in my heels and I, I judged the prophet. Almost instantly, man, within the next hour or two, just bombs were going off in my mind and heart. From, It's like, I guess you call it personal revelation, but within the next few hours, I, I just knew that I had sat in judgment of Joseph Smith and of the early saints for something that our father was so pleased with them about, for something that he had asked them to do, and that was absolutely noble and glorious that they surrendered to the obedience of faith and followed the prophetic revelation about that, that thing of polygamy that came through the prophet Joseph Smith that, that I had basically slandered in my heart, something that was super precious to our father. And I could see why. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is why. That's why. This is why. That's why. This is why. That's why. All of a sudden, it's like, it made, it made complete sense to me. So this is a clip from a talk given at a state conference by uh, BYU professor, church historian Garrett 
Dirk Matt. I already did a response with Bill Real to a lot of his talk, but this clip specifically, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. To come to the conclusion that, well, because there are so many arguments against Joseph Smith, well, then there must be some truth to the fact that maybe he wasn't uh, a prophet of God. But if we were to apply that same standard to the Savior of all mankind, what was Jesus most often accused of in the Bible? He was most often accused of either being possessed by the devil or being the devil. So when someone wants to say, well, there wouldn't be so many negative things said about him if, if some of it wasn't true, well, Jesus actually gives us a demonstration that actually that can absolutely be the case. What I'm saying here is probably the most obvious thing in the world, but I will spell it out. People say a lot of things. There's a lot of false things that are said in the world, a lot of unsupported claims that go uncriticized all the time and have no opposition. And there are also a lot of true, well-supported claims that also face no opposition. So claiming that an argument must be true because it's being criticized or because it's being opposed can, it's, it's basically just an attempt to deflect the legitimate criticism. It's a real obvious take your mask off mo moment when you hear somebody say, well, look how much opposition I have. That means I'm all the more true. And I don't want to fall into that. I don't want to have any kind of like martyr complex. I want my arguments to stand on their own right. So we'll deflect legitimate criticism and they want to dismiss honest, good arguments that are sound, that are have evidence supporting them, any opposing viewpoint uh, without actually engaging in them while still uh, firmly thinking that they're right. So to avoid this fallacy, you're gonna have to actually evaluate the arguments, go into that lion's den, and based on the merits of the arguments and the evidence and the reasoning that's given, supporting it rather than just relying on a reaction or opinion to determine the validity of your argument. Because again, a lot of things can go on questions. A lot of things are questioned. And if your firmness in how right you are about a thing has anything to do with how other people feel about it, how the opinions might be, uh, might be negative or whatever, you have to take into account how your emotions are playing into why you're believing the things you're believing. Because nobody could say anything about the claims about your religion. If, you're, if your evidence can't stand on its own and it's coming from a reactionary doubling down uh, uh, backfire effect type feeling, uh, that's something that you should probably look into. Any negative things said about him if, if some of it wasn't true. Well, Jesus actually gives us a demonstration that actually that can absolutely be the case. <laughs> So Christians, sound off your, your comments on that, comparing Joseph Smith when people question things that happened 200 years ago versus your Lord and Savior. I would love to hear from Christians on that one. Um, but that one is just a train wreck in the face of a logical fallacy to me. What do you think, Bill? So let's start with Jesus. The reason Jesus was persecuted was because he was going after the leaders within his own religious system. So if we're going to compare anybody to Jesus in the way that Dirk Mott is suggesting, it would need to be the critics that Joseph Smith and the church went after and got rid of. Folks like um, uh, William Law, uh, mm -hmm. William Marks by Brigham Young after the death of Joseph Smith, like any insider in the church who's raising a voice of criticism and Joseph Smith or Brigham Young in the top leadership get rid of that person, that would be the more uh, equitable comparison to Jesus because he was criticizing the leaders within his Jewish faith while he was a participating Jew. Right on. The sun is setting and it's when it gets up to here, that means it's time to go get a drink. So I got to hurry. Next is cherry picking or confirmation bias. Um, to be honest, this one made me really sad and made me really mad. <laughs> uh, I was checking out the old Midnight Mormons, uh, Quaker Cardinalis, Brad something or other, pro-Mormon podcast for like the cool kids, kids who don't want to follow the rules, who still want to be called Mormon, not Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at midnight or anything. Um, and this video from just a couple days ago, uh, they were talking about, it's the videos, the title is how to make an anti-Mormon podcast featuring Patrick Mason versus Jacob Hansen. I don't need to get into the entire context here. Clip, they are reacting to John DeLynn, reacting to Elder Holland, chosen to 
speak at uh, Southern Utah University's commencement speech. In my opinion, John is just representing uh, the opinions of LGBTQ folks at Southern Utah University who do not want somebody um, as homophobic as Elder Holland speaking there, play John DeLynn, and then what their reaction is to it was actually quite surprising to me. Very clearly, There's a lot of people that happen to have this opinion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it's the cry bully tactics. Okay, well, John DeLynn again, okay. Saying that's fair, that's just how they feel. Um, why pick Elder Holland? Why not pick a scholar? Why not pick uh, like a true scholar? Um, <laughs> other public figures that are less polarizing, especially when, when we know that there's an LGBTQ um, depression, anxiety, and or even suicide sort of epidemic historically within the Utah kind of Mormon context. There's so many other people that could have been chosen at a public university. And for the for the LGBT, you know, students that worked four or six years to get their undergraduate or graduate degrees, legal, same-sex committed love, that that's just a, a choice that's unnecessary and and um, maybe inappropriate. Okay. Do we, do we have to watch more? The only problem with John Delaney, he really is Korobor. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I, I, well, I just, I, I just want to hear Cody's reaction to that. Okay. Well, I mean, this is where me not really knowing too much, outside of just the one clip I saw, I mean, is there any reason why, um, who was it, the individual speaking of, Elder Holland? I Elder believe? Holland, yeah. Is there any reason why he in particular would be offensive to LGBT people aside from just being a representative of the Mormon church? Or is like the things he's done, things he's been accused of? I, what I want to get the, to... the answer, though, is no. Yeah, Cody. no. Like, okay, so like he's yeah. Mormon. They just hate him because he's Mormon. And he said musket fire in that speech, and that was absolutely unacceptable. This is where we're at, bro. Like, when we tell you these people are crazy, like, we're not kidding. So they have this other guy as, like, a co-host who is supposed to just be a non-biased. He's just a regular guy. We can trust his opinions. Um, he's, like, Catholic, half Jewish, half Catholic or something. Um, and so he doesn't know a lot about the context. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's in the swing of things um, about how upset LGBTQ people um, that when Elder Holland said in this Musket Fire talk, uh, 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 calling out my friend Matt Easton, who was the valedictorian of BYU in 2019, and during his speech he said something just basic that was approved, like, I know, I know that I am a beloved gay son of my Heavenly Father, and then, I think two years later, Elder Holland comes up trying to imbue a lot of, like, faith and courage at the beginning of the school year into the staff and into uh, students of BYU uh, by saying we need to, you know, I want to hear a little more musket fire around here, not literally, but that's a that's a violent metaphor to be used on somebody in a marginalized community. Put that aside for a second. But then also Elder Holland saying that this is, it is not the time to bogard the mic, like, you know who, uh, talking about their personal sex life, something to that effect. And uh, making people who are queer within the Mormon church uh, feeling the things that I think that you can guess that they feel <laughs> about being in a church that has one set standard for how to gain exaltation, how to be accepted by God is going against what you feel like is your very nature. And uh, the church still encourages people to get into mixed orientation marriages as if that will cure you, as if just being in a marriage, a loveless marriage, a marriage uh, with the person you're not attracted to, if that's like the way to God. So a lot of people, uh, obviously, I don't need to tell you this. Um, hopefully that's obvious and I don't need to tell you that people who who are attracted to their same sex they're gonna have a problem with that and they're going to have some ideas about perhaps unaliving themselves you saw the documentary that abc and hulu put out called mormon no more with lena and sal matt easton is in it i'm in the background in a couple scenes they cut out a lot of my interviews but i'm in that one and as that documentary uh really really uh painfully lays out um the problem with trying to be inside an institution that kind of makes you believe that you could just unalive yourself and get to the social kingdom faster because all you're going to do is just struggle with this temptation and with this sin as the one person named Harry Fisher who went to BYU as he did that and as Matt Easton describes in that documentary also in his Mormon stories interview that of course that does happen so it is not an anomaly it it is an outgrowth of of church and doctrine and culture that squeezes uh, queer people into a round peg square hole situation that they were not able to fit within. But anyway, keep going. Oh, quick, you have some. Well, okay. I get, I'm very much annoyed by anybody who, um, so if I, if I make a podcast all about why, um, Brad Whitbeck is a terrible person. Yeah. And then a year later, I, uh, I, Brad Whitbeck gets chosen to speak at a school and I say, 
have you not seen the stuff I've made about him? This guy's polarizing. That seems like you're just, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, like you can't, you can't say someone's bad and then act later like everybody's saying this person. No, you did, guy. Yeah. Like you did. <laughs> that I don't. I, 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 I. That is really annoying. So the logical fallacy that I think is extremely mind numbing right here is it could be a lot of things. I would qualify. I would qualify this as being cherry picking or confirmation bias. Everyone's saying, no, you did. So he's pointing to John DeLynn, saying that with John DeLynn's platform, he's core whore. It's his job to tear down the Mormon church that we, of course, know is true. And so it's not a representation of how generally queer people feel in the church. It's you said that, John. You're giving all these people to speak on a platform to just air their complaints. So there's a confirmation bias because they don't want to listen to John DeLynn or anyone he brings on their podcast. Um, they have a cherry-picked idea about how a queer person experiences the LDS church. And I have another clip I could play. I have a friend. Uh, he left BYU. I'm not sure where he's at now, but he's he's gay. He's dating a guy. And he he and I were in an argument, and he was like, well, it's just, you know, the apostles are, try are they're, they're killing people by their words and everything. I'm like, they're not killing people. What are you talking about? And it ended with him saying, well, you wouldn't even want me in church because I'm gay and I have a boyfriend. And I said, of course I want you in church. And that's the like, whole Wait, argument and he's like that's Wait, what and i said yeah we will literally pick you up right now if you want to go to church we picked them up they came with us to church <laughs> but and we, it was a great sunday like, and he you know, was only brainwashed into thinking that he wasn't welcoming your congregation yeah. because of what what all these what john delan jeremy runnels all the and mormons because, free because of the internet wannabes. and they were yeah but they were telling they're it's not based having, in reality well making them speak in code pretending he was upset about something else as opposed to just what he was upset about and mm -hmm. when the honesty came you realized that no, we all wanted him there. <laughs> and like, nobody was like, like, yes, you were here with your boyfriend and you're holding hands in the pew and everybody in the YSA ward is fine. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. mad. So here, and we can clear this up that, right now. You know? We can clear, clear this up right now to all my LGBTQ buddies, okay? Anybody that says you're not loved by your father in heaven or by your fellow church members is absolutely lying to you. Anybody that says you're not welcome or uh, or that your congregation doesn't want you to show up is lying to you in order to profit off of you. And if there is an example of somebody who has treated you unfairly or has been homophobic or so on and so forth, like any good system, I'm sure there's bad apples, okay? You need to do one of two things. Come here and go to church with me in Los Angeles. <laughs> Quaker will come and pick you up. Somebody that's telling you otherwise is telling it to you because they profit more off you out of it than the people who are volunteering and not making money profit off of you being out of it. And they are liars. They are grifting and they are home wrecking for profit. I'm looking at you and you know exactly who you are. And so this is a problem. This is a fallacy uh, when somebody is selectively choosing and presenting only the evidence and information that supports their preconceived beliefs or agenda. The, this church is for anyone. Queer people can totally exist in this church while ignoring and dismissing any contradictory evidence, any contradictory information. It's just people complaining. It's not actually uh, a, a wider problem that should be addressed. You have a church and you really believe that this covenant path is supposed to be for everyone. And if somebody's saying, I physically can't do it, then they're gonna have to reinforce these these biases and only go after a selective uh, amount of inputs. And their perspective is going to start going like that and be very limited. So it's an important way to, I think this is an important fallacy as somebody who purports to be Christian to actually look at how people experience the church that you're talking about and not how you have a confirmation bias and you have cherry picked evidence to tell them how they should experience this church. Do I believe that there are progressive Mormons who, if they see, you know, two gay guys in the back of their congregation holding hands, do I believe that there are Mormons who will look back and say, oh, I'm so glad they're here. That's awesome. I want to be welcoming. Yeah, I probably would have been one of those type of Mormons. Yeah, do those type of people exist? Is that the rule or is that an exception to the rule? And that's an important uh, differentiation here to make. And so if you look at the studies of what it's like to be uh, queer and Mormon, their levels of anxiety, depression, uh, suicidality, statistically, they're uh, well above, statistically, they're going to be well above normal. And so we have a cherry picking example. We have a confirmation bias example. We have a bunch of people here who uh, have an interest in confirming their own biases around what it is like to be a queer person 
generally speaking, and ignore and dismiss the evidence that contradicts those beliefs. And so this fallacy is particularly egregious and pernicious to me because it can lead someone to reject valid data. And I would say like valid empathy that you would have for somebody who doesn't have a happy experience in the LDS church as a queer person um, and actually challenge them on their actual experiences, lived experiences of what they have been through for your beliefs. When you cherry pick off of, I know, when you cherry pick off of the example of like, well, I'm a nice person, I like gay people, I will let them sit next to me, that says nothing about the evidence generally. That only speaks to your inability to take in other viewpoints and perspectives and you are purposely discounting a diverse source of information to actually evaluate critically what the truth of the matter, the truth of what queer people in the church actually face, as opposed to your, ch your cherry picked examples from your experiences that just also happen to be positive, that also make the church like super one size fits all for everyone. Again, that's not gonna be people's, people's experiences. So you're more interested in supporting your beliefs. So you're more interested in cherry picking for your conclusions um, than looking at something critically with a wide lens and taking in uh, various inputs. It was very ironic when it's like, in the name of Jesus Christ, they do it. Like, in the name of Jesus Christ, I need to engage in all of these fallacious arguments. These types of things are always gonna be in conflict with our best evidence about why people are the way that they are, why they show up in this world being attracted to the same sex. Um, and so people are going to engage in these what I think are very horrific um, examples of cherry picking to still help people think that you can still exist in this church, you're still fine. And I, sorry, I think the data and also me as being a content creator, the overwhelming evidence of what I've seen about the devastating consequences. So this next clip is from Stephen Jones, who he's either a current former seminary teacher for the church, and he uh, was an actor and he has a podcast and he has different types of apologists and people who work for the church on. And um, I'm not quite as interested in what the apologist says, which I've done some response videos to uh, what this BYU professor has to say, but I'm more interested in what Stephen Jones has to say in this clip that's really interesting. And I call it a confirmation bias, and I'll tell you why in a second. A lot of time and research does go into making these videos. So the Patreon, where I put up all of my videos, like podcasts, audio only, and then also without any YouTube ads. So I have videos that I made for over a year, and you can go listen to my whole catalog of videos if you're interested. Thank you so much to my hoes at Hotown and Hotown City Council. Mayors of Hotown. If you want to be the mayor of Hotown, you can do that over on my patreon.com slash nuanceo. On to this Stephen Jones clip. They're having this long discussion where they're talking about basically that all of the racist teachings about black people or about, let's say, Native Americans, um, they can all just be swept under this umbrella of prophets make mistakes. And here's a really interesting apologetic type of spin, type of argument, justification, allowance that Stephen Jones makes. But I feel like the biggest point you're making is that if we go so far on this opposite end of the spectrum of saying they cannot make a mistake, they cannot be fallible at all. No, no, certainly not a mistake this big. This big? Yeah. Then we're doomed, you know? Yeah. And the, and the question, I think it's a good one, is like, well, then why didn't like God why? like intervene? Yeah. Why didn't he intervene? It? Why didn't yeah. he fix yeah. it, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that's a fantastic question. Like the, the, the ultimate answer is he did in 1978 right but the question is yeah but why didn't he do it earlier right well he well and did you know what for me my own perspective and i don't yeah please. this is my own honest perspective yeah i believe he did in whatever calendar you use when jesus came and he redeemed the world hmm. the worst case scenario of anything of any scenario and i'm not trying to i know i'm not trying to oversimplify it but i'm but in fact it's not that simple because it is it's very deep the atonement of Jesus Christ is that deep. Mm. The atonement of Jesus Christ is that profound. The atonement of Jesus Christ is that real, mm. that it can redeem something that could seem as huge. Yeah. And, and it is huge yeah. for many people. Right. He can redeem that. Right. And so in 78, in 1978, yes. But even before then, I believe personally, mm. he already won. We have to remember that he already overcame everything. Mm. you know and that's that's what gives me personally comfort in this mm. and i believe that and that might seem oversimplified but I mean, again it's not that's not a simple thing that he did 
I don't think that the atonement of Christ was simple. Right. You know? No. So you're saying, if I could restate what you're saying, uh, God already fixed the problems that would be caused with weak, simple, error-prone sinners who are working, who he's working through. Like, he already took all that into account when he atoned for their sins, right? If you ask... If you yeah. ask Jesus, like, what do you what do you love most about what you do, right? I, I bet that would be it. I bet he'd say, I love forgiving people. I love redeeming people. I love, I love when people think that they've lost it all, that they actually haven't, and I can help them feel that. And I can help them, like, feel whole again when they've made, they've made mistakes that have hurt people in real life, right? from prophets down to the least of us. Uh, I think he would say something like that. that. That's the vibe I get from Jesus in scripture is he delights to forgive and to work with weak, simple, error prone sinners. So this is an interesting confirmation bias for me because if you are again, baking into your argument that these men can just be forgiven uh, no repentance needs to be made, no statements by the church saying we absolutely got it wrong, we need to come out. If you can just, especially as a black person, just say to yourself that that is all waved away by the atonement. That's the purpose of the atonement. You're baking into your argument a confirmation bias that you assume that is how the atonement works. And this type of reasoning is dangerous to allow people who say that they speak for God, they proclaim his doctrine, to be able to get away with proclaiming doctrine that's not only false, but it's it's not only it's not not only harmful in the context of Mormonism that you have a prophet that is hindering the salvation of you know millions and billions of people because of the color of their skin because of something that their made up forefather Cain did back during Adam and Eve times in Jackson County, Missouri, where. Adam and Eve lived apparently. So not only is it within your own context, it's harmful to the saints. It's it's dangerous to believe. It's a very fundamentalist type argument that falls in line with saying that like God can command a prophet to kill anyone that he wants because all of the sins are going to be forgiven anyway. And it's going to, it's, that's a flawed and dangerous argument. And it's based on a misunderstanding and misappropriation of the concept of atonement and forgiveness. So you could say, yes, it is true that the atonement provides a way for individuals to be uh, forgiven of their sins. It cannot be given as a license for people to do whatever they want without consequences. And there's a big difference in those. So I can understand the like cognitive biases that exist, whether in black members of the church or anyone in, who knows racism is, who knows racism is wrong within the church, um, who make allowances and it's always interesting to me what those allowances are in Mormon's minds. But it, there is a confirmation bias there that if you believe on insufficient evidence that there is an atonement theology that operates within the context of your prophets speaking as mouthpieces of God who are allowed to claim false and harmful doctrine, but that the atonement itself that's baked into that forgives all of that. That, that should actually cancel its, itself out. I think that lends itself to, to a lot of dangerous things, a lot of dangerous and immoral things that Joseph Smith did that kind of make you think that like, can you kill as many people as you want? Can you have sex with as many underage girls? How many flaws can you have until you're no longer a prophet if all of those sins are gonna be washed away anyway? Um, that's a very dangerous argument and I think it's a misunderstanding and misapplication of the concept of what Jesus' atonement, at least is his baseline trying to get across in terms of forgiveness. So while I think that the atonement uh, provides individuals a way to repent of their sins in like a Mormon context, it doesn't give anyone license to do whatever they want without consequences in a hundred billion dollar organization. And that very atonement idea, there's so many things within Mormonism, like the, the second anointing ceremony where you can lie for the Lord. While the atonement is supposed to provide people this light, the salvation, this idea of redemption, if what it's doing in actuality is uh, it's having unintended consequences that actually motivate individuals and churches, institutions to not even avoid sin, to not even avoid sin and not even strive to live a righteous life because the atonement and the ability to lie for the Lord will just wash everything away and make everything clean and cool and kosher in the church, that's a problem. Claiming that a prophet can preach false doctrine 
about the skin color of a person uh, being a negative consequence that they have to then live that they have to teach their kids that they have to have a negative self-perception about who they are in relationship to the God that they're learning about within your church that is that is uh, disregarding the value of human life, the dignity of human life that is supposed to be implied in, you know, we're all God's children. It's implying that a prophet's authority and standing before God, that that gives him a free pass to do these types of heinous acts. And so it's, it's still a misrepresentation of the purpose of the atonement, but people are going to be able to have this confirmation bias, but because they have a motivated reasoning to keep believing that these prophets are still prophets, what's the reasoning? What can we grab at here? Can it just be that Jesus Christ's aton atonement that they told us about washes all of this stuff away? So. so this next one we have is a false dilemma. That's at least what jumps out to me. You can tell me what you think. There, there's always, a, again, a Venn diagram of a couple different things going on. Uh, this is from a clip from a Quaker talking on Midnight Mormons uh, from about a year ago. Uh, after the Elder Holland musket fire talk at Eddie Gate at BYU, and it's called to jab or not to jab Elder Holland fallout with the last dispensation. What's kind of interesting to me is, and maybe because I'm from Texas and I'm a Southerner, and the gay people I knew in high school were also Texas Southerners, uh, but they were tough. And I get to Utah, and all I'm seeing is, you know, uh, insert vagueness here. If the church doesn't change its doctrines, if you do not change this ceremony, then people will kill themselves. The gay people I grew up with was, were way tougher than that. If you do not change that ceremony specifically, then all these people will kill themselves. I don't believe that's true. I it do not believe that's true. And also, let me say, there's been a lot of connections um, with with this, with race in Utah. And, you know, people said, well, you know, the church had the 1978 revelation and allowed black people, black men to hold the priesthood. Is this the same thing as that? Not once in the past couple of years as BLM and all that stuff has happened, have I heard one black person say, stop police brutality or I will kill myself. Nor have I heard any white person say, we must stop this or the black people will kill themselves. Why is it that all these Utah journalists just go stand on the graves of dead LGBT kids and say, you better change this doctrine and change your scriptures or... Billy and Sally will kill themselves. To me, that just seems insulting, not only to LGBTQ people, insulting to anybody. It's just, it, and, it's, it's such a cynical look at society and such a push yeah. of weakness. And, and I would say it's beyond insulting. It's actually damaging because I think you could have had a ton of people just ignore that this talk ever even happened. But now you have people sharing this as though it's a reasonable response for them to think that suicidal ideation is a reasonable response to an old man telling all of these people at BYU that they need to be doing. So there's a lot of things that are wrong with this already, but he is absolutely posing this false dilemma fallacy and sometimes called the false choice fallacy. And this occurs when someone uh, presents a limited number of options as if those are the only possibilities. So this is a really important one to talk about. Conservatives and liberals argue over the same type of idea as well, where there is a problem going on and there's one side that wants to talk about the problem and then the other side says that, hey, by you talking about the problem, you are putting it into people's psyche that it is a problem and then they're gonna internalize that and they're gonna make up that it's more of a problem than it actually ever is. Um, that, can, that can kind of happen, but it seems like the most obvious conclusion to draw that if you are told your entire life that your salvation depends on you changing your orientation of who you're attracted to and that you have to live a life, have kids with somebody who you are not sexually attracted to or maybe otherwise, um, all for your salvation and fitting this square peg in a round hole, uh, I think, again, statistically speaking, that's a difficult thing for queer people to try to operate within the framework of the, I hate using the word heteronormative because I hear my conservative self from four years ago. If anyone said heteronormative, I'd have just been like, I'm not listening. But it's it's where being homosexual is, an, is, a, is a flaw, is a problem, is something to work on. Uh, and being heterosexual is the standard it is god's standard feeling like you're not made for that but you're still trying to operate within the church yeah you're gonna have a lot of problems so not only do we have a strong false equivalency going on here between um how black people and like the blm protests and how uh, black people trying to fight to gain rights and equity in america 
it has similar overlaps, but it is different than the queer person's experience. And it's going to be different, especially within the context of the LDS church. And uh, so straight up, that's just like a false equivalency to me. But the wider point is that this is a false dilemma that is being used as if like acknowledging the problem is creating the biggest problem of all by presenting these two choices um, as if either acknowledging the problem and it is creating a bigger problem or we could just ignore the problem altogether. And so it's forcing these two false choices, not being able to consider their other pop, uh, not being able to consider that there's other possible solutions uh, that could be taken. Cause it's weird to admit that there are LGBTQ dead Mormon kids in graves. And then to say that how there are people who stand on those graves telling people that they can't make it in this church. Um, I wish that those 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 journalists, those activists, people, I wish that we could have got that message out to them sooner before they unalive themselves. Isn't that not evidence that, that of the, the grave that they're standing on? So it's weird to use that to support your argument. But regardless of that, uh, the idea that you guys, John Dillon and me, uh, by advocating for people to, uh, for advocating for things and policies within the church that at least give people a little bit more equal standing, give people better uh, ability to understand that no, being gay is not like being a pedophile. Being gay is not like practicing bestiality. So it's just a different orientation that uh, exists in nature. And it's obvious that it's going to exist even within the people who are in Christ One True Church, uh, that that somehow is by acknowledging that that's a problem for some people to operate within, that we are forcing the problem on people. I don't know what they want to do. Gay people exist. They they don't want gay people's stories to, to be heard. Um, and so the dilemma here is that for them, it's like, if we talk about these stories, then more people are going to think that they're gay and they're going to create this problem. And we're just like people like me, that I'm a proponent of weakness of people who can't handle something where there's a lot of other options that could be going on here. For instance, where Quaker said that like the people where I'm from in Texas, the gay people are a lot more tough. I don't know the context. Maybe the people in Texas had to be a lot more tough and like they had to go through a lot more queer bashing that they never should have gone through in the first place. They're just like used to getting beat up. Like, I don't know what that means. So there are a lot of other possibilities than just, than just this really type of black and white false dilemma of an argument that, that, that people like me are trying to push weakness onto members of the queer community that you can't make it in this church, not taking into the actual evidence that a lot of people, are, they're not weak, they just, it's not a weakness option, as opposed to if you were just strong enough in your convictions, you would be able to make it out. There's a lot more options and a lot more nuance in this situation than that. There's more than just this false dilemma at play here. And it's obviously kind of used as an attack on people like me and John Dillon and other people who are just trying to stand up and say that gay people exist and they should be given the same rights and it's not like an imposition to you in the church. Um, doesn't take away from your marriage, things like that. And then another one of my very favorite uh, false dilemmas of all time, Hank Smith, who is a teacher in the church, uh, an author, I call him Hank Smith, Mormon propagandist. And he had this tweet once that said, it's interesting that those who leave the church but remain Christian keep the doctrines Joseph Smith taught. Marriage in the next life, God and Christ are separate beings, the dead can't repent, heavenly mother, premortal life, but leaving the church means leaving the doctrine as well. If you leave the church over plural marriage, you don't have to worry about marriage in the next life at all. But because you believe something, you de facto had to have get, gotten it from Joseph Smith. And there's a people will say the, that argument, but like Jesus Christ, he was either a con man, a liar, or a psychopath, if you don't believe what he's saying is true. I was like, no, there's actually a lot more nuance in what could be going on in this situation. And people can still hold on to not true things that give them comfort and still reject a person who has that teaching in common with their beliefs. So Lindsay Hanson Park, director of Sunstone and Your Polygamy Podcast, who's the bomb, she replied to Hank Smith and when he said, if you leave the church over plural marriage, you don't have to worry about marriage in the next life. And she goes, don't threaten me with a good time. Which leads me into my next logical fallacy, which is the slippery slope 
fallacy. And who better to exemplify that one than Rod Meldrum. Rod Meldrum was my famous last interview at Mormon Stories. I'm pulling this clip directly from a response video I did about a month ago, going back through this episode. And I started with like a trigger warning of like, he's gonna say the things. So let's look at the slippery slope arguments of Rod Meldrum, proponent of the Heartland model, leader of the Firm Foundation when he was on Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, what caused me to just like, kind of lose my mind that like my parents love this guy. My parents buy all his books, they go to all his conferences, they follow him around. How deep is his logic around gay people? Are you willing to listen to people who say that? Whenever you go against principles of truth, okay, that it is going to be difficult, okay, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Now, the, again, if you take things to their logical extremes, um, for example, the uh, would our civilization survive if everyone had same-sex attraction? If everybody was gay, would we survive as a people or, or as people in general? Would there would there still be? I'm just going to say this is as offensive as the racism conversation, or worse, yeah, and probably. I so the slippery slope fallacy occurs when someone is interested in asserting that a particular event or action will inevitably lead to a series of increasingly negative consequences and they don't provide any sufficient evidence to support what would be casual links uh, between each step of the argument. There's a staircase here missing. So um, in this example of a slippery slope uh, argument about how if we accept homosexuality, it will inevitably lead to the fact that nobody's gonna have children anymore and you don't have really supported any evidence of that claim. So that's a problem first and foremost, just besides the fact that it's stupid and homophobic. So this type of argument assumes on no evidence that, that homosexuality, just accepting that that's how people are and that's how they choose to live their lives, that that will somehow discourage and prevent people from having children, uh, again, without providing any logical evidentiary support for this assertion. Um, and then it's also important to recognize that the slippery slope argument. And so it's tricky territory to get into when things look like a slippery slope argument uh, to actually evaluate the pieces critically because a slippery slope can be used to manipulate and persuade people um, from a fear-mongering point of view without giving them evidence that actually supports the claim that you made. I would say that there are ways where A equals B, B equals C, A equals C, but those have to be supported by actual evidence and not just be taken on face value from like a, a manipulative or fear-mongering point of view where you're trying to get uh, an emotional reaction out of people, you're trying to instill fear in them. And so it's important to evaluate each claim critically um, and not manipulate or persuade people without providing uh, substantial evidence to support it. So just slippery slope arguments are all over the place and it's important that we actually present uh, evidence. And then in the next clip, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Let's talk about the example of false equivalency that he uses. For example, example of but some people from the very structure that they live in day to day feeling suffocated because of their gender identity or sexual orientation or the color of their skin or them being a woman or a man, that there are certain expectations that the church's structure puts on them, that they live every day. There, there's some cultural aspects that I think you're right. Okay, but there's also uh, some assumptions that I think are incorrect. Somebody who goes out and kills someone um, may feel pretty darn uncomfortable about uh, about that commandment, don't you think? Very God, few God are said murderers, not to kill. So. And <laughs> Name then, something else. <laughs> no, no, this, 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 but something it, that is everybody that people deal though. with. It's an I'm example. talking about things. It's an extreme example. I would, extreme I would examples admit. aren't helpful though because we're talking about the reasons but why people is, live, why people the find their religion toxic. It. Rod, Rod, it's people don't find, it. people, people do not find the church suffocating and the fruits rotten because we're not allowed to murder. That's okay. not what I'm talking All about. Right, let, 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 let's take another one. Let's take pedophilia. People don't okay. find the church toxic because we're not allowed to be okay. pedophiles. If, if, so, if somebody find the wants to be, because if somebody not really to be feels that I am, I was born a pedophile. Yeah, and this I is just not a good like example, Rod. <laughs> sex with, <laughs> little, with little kids. Rod, this is not a good and example. And it makes me uncomfortable when the church talks about pedophilia as being wrong. And therefore I'm going to go out and commit 
you know, suicide because I feel Rob, uncomfortable that's not about a the good church example. Unit. Hold on. Oh, that's not okay. a good example. Why use not? The, use the one that What's I What's wrong use. with the example? Because nobody leaves the church. Nobody en masse. Leaves. Well, you said about sexual orientation. One of the sexual orientations is pedophilia, right? This is an example of a false equivalency fallacy. And that occurs when two things are compared. They're not equivalent. Mm -mm. And the argument always assumes that they are equivalent in some way that has not yet been justified. So in this case, the argument is comparing homosexuality and child sex abusers um, by assuming that they are equivalent because they both have the rejection of God, the condemnation of God and his designs for sex. So uh, just in case that's something you believe, let me just like sweep that away real quick if you're interested. I don't think that what I just said would even logically make sense because you're probably a little bit far gone, but just in case, um, for one, the comparison, it's not logically equivalent. Homosexuality and child sex abuse are fundamentally different things um, and comparing them in, is no way valid. One thing has consent and the other thing does not. The second is that uh, the argument is based on a false assumption and that assumption is that homosexuality involves a rejection of God's designs for sex. And that is just a religious belief. That is not everyone's shared belief. That is an opinion. That is a belief that is not supported. That is a uh, supernatural, that is a moral claim about what you believe about the supernatural that not everyone believes. And then the third one, the big one, that it is a false premise. The premise that homosexuality is inherently immoral to engage in or inherently harmful to engage in and that is not supported by evidence or reason and that is a matter of personal that is a matter of personal opinion or belief whereas uh, child sex abuse and bestiality is inherently immoral because it is inherently harmful, that is supported by the evidence, that is supported by reason, that is supported by people's lived experiences and every study under the sun that we could show, that is not a matter of personal opinion or belief. Them's the facts. I said, I said before and I'll say it again, I'm like Mormons, come get your Mormons because there are people like Rod Meldrum out here making you look really, really scary and stupid. So. And then I don't have a clip for this one, but this is pervasive all across Mormon apologetics, all over different types of argumentation. Um, it is when people change the definition of a word um, as it's supposed to be intended to fit their argument. So when somebody does this, it's called an equivocation fallacy. So an equivocation occurs when there is a key term or phrase that's that's suddenly now up for debate. And you uh, projecting what you want onto the meaning of that word that is advantageous to your argument that is going to lead to a, a logical inconsistency and, a, and therefore like a false conclusion. So when somebody changes the definition of a word, like you need to be able to get your words and your definitions down straight for, so that you're both on the same page. But abolishes and people use these types of words to their advantage. So example in the church, if somebody argues that uh, Joseph Smith translated the book of Abraham through these ancient papyri texts by the hand of Abraham. And if in an argument you're saying translated means that it was in one language and then you read it and then you, you take what the, what that meant in that original language and then you move it into the other one that you're speaking and explain it in that way and then translate in the Mormon context, they will redefine that term. There's an equivocation problem here where they say translate when he meant it. I know it looks like that Joseph Smith didn't translate anything at all because we have Egyptologists that tell us that, that Joseph Smith got literally everything wrong, that Joseph Smith got everything wrong. And I know that might look like he's a false prophet who was like, trying to be a big guy saying that he knew how to translate. But if we just change the word of what translate mean, what translate actually means is like a catalyst. Like he like read it and then he was like, got an idea from God. And translate actually means it was like a catalyst, inspiration, null text. And that still works. That still allows us to keep believing the things that we want to believe. And then there's another logical fallacy where people just will not trust a source because they have a bias against them and think that they work for Satan, for example. So there's this Midnight Mormons clip. They're talking about John DeLynn and how, first of all, you can't listen to anything that he says because he's 
Coral Horror. I made the same argument in my response video that'll be linked down below where I was talking about Rod Meldrum, where Rod Meldrum's like, how could we believe anything about Joseph Smith's treasure digging when all of the sources come from Falassa's Hurlbut, or they all come from people who wanted uh, Joseph Smith's, you know, Joseph Smith dead or they hated his guts or anything. Um, at the root of them, they are ad hominem and they are attacking the messenger type fallacies. When somebody feels the need to attack the person making the argument rather than the argument itself, and you're questioning their character and their motives and their affiliations, and especially in the context of Latter-day Saints, who do believe that if you leave the church, you did so under the enticings of the evil one, under Satan. And so because of this perceived bias, you have an affiliation with the enemy, such as Satan, that's an odd, that's that's going to be an ad hominem. And so you can't actually look at John DeLand or me or whoever and evaluate the evidence of the things that we're saying. You're taking into account our character, our background, instead of the argument for what it is. And so I think while it's reasonable to be skeptical of all sources and it's, 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 and understand people's biases of where they're coming from, um, I, I left the church. I don't believe it's true. Uh, so obviously while it is reasonable to be skeptical of sources, and know where people's biases are and where they have conflicts of interest. Um, that is one thing that we all have to kind of deal with, but it is it is upon every person to take it upon themselves to examine arguments and evidence to determine if the argument is valid or not, rather than just dismissing them, just dismissing them outright based on your your prejudices about your prejudices about that person, your biases around that they work for this this entity of of lucifer very theory that very idea that there are operatives for satan i mean do you want me to read off to you the quotes from from the prophets who said that cain's seed came through noah's flood through egyptus and the reason was because satan needed to have representation on earth through the african race so you're the the church kind of lives and breathes off of these uh, fear-mongering ad hominem attacks that there are people who want to get you away from your testimony and if me just saying that me just saying a fact like guess what the church used to teach that black people were represented black people existed to be representatives of Satan just by saying that putting it on the internet having that exist giving Mormons the impression that maybe your prophets are a thousand times percent more fallible than maybe you even realized. Um, by doing that, I might be shaking your testimony. I might be nuancing your testimony. And then by doing that again, I'm operating within this Mormon paradigm of this ad hominem where I, Mormons are going to look at me with like, well, you're only saying that because you want me to shake your testimony. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone should operate in the church with the most amount of information to be able to have the most balanced perspectives and healthy things do not come out of insane fundamentalism and orthodoxy and uh, holding too tightly to a structure that's supposed to be concrete. And it's not that I'm gonna come and put cracks in that, it's that the very structure of itself is faulty. The very pillars themselves are not sitting on solid rock. The wise man built his house upon a rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand is a song that we would sing in primary growing up in the little Sunday school lessons. And then as you grow up, it just so happens that people have shelf items whether they hear about them or not. And there are people that need to validate, you know, people's experiences being queer in the church. People need to validate that like, as a woman in the church, I understand completely why uh, polygamy made you feel like a second class citizen. Uh, it's not that we are putting these ideas into your head. It's not that we are, uh, we are telling you things that you need to get be mad about. It is for the sole purpose that this church has ramifications from the doctrine and people have actual lived experiences of not being able to fit these pieces together, feeling like they're taking crazy pills. And so for me as a content creator to be able to do that, to be able to offer information and content and stuff, I'm always going to be, you know, <laughs> I'm always going to be told that, you know, you think that you're doing something good right now, but we'll see what God has to say in heaven when he sends you to hell, nuance out, right? So um, I don't operate within that framework. I don't operate within that. So that attack is not really like scaring me. Again, going back to Lindsay Hanson Parks, like, okay, I, I don't get to be in heaven with Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. Like, don't threaten me with a good time. Um, people making fun of my nose and things uh, are showing the weakness and the uh, inability to be able to engage with arguments um, that there's just no right answer out of. The right answer 
nuances take on things the right answer out of things is usually at least bare minimum a nuanced perspective uh yeah about the about the truth claims of mormonism right like it's one thing to have faith but then to have faith it's one thing to have faith and to be hopeful for things that you would like to see that you project onto some type of maker onto your reasons for being here on earth that's a wonderful i think like human experience to kind of have to have like this wonderment about it but then for that to be uh taken a hold of by a high demand religion who gives you a list of you know 500 items of how to be able to like self-actualized how to be able to be with that maker again to be with your family relations forever to be able to have the spirit with you is going to be through jumping through all of these hoops when they are hoops that I don't think are meant for human hoop jumping and that is borne out by the evidence because again we're talking about a church that it started 200 years ago that's not informed and that Elder Holland says stuff like you know the world goes here and we go here and the world goes here and we go here evident that for a church to be able to operate in 2023, it can't hold as tightly to the doctrines that it used to one day. And it's gonna take people like me to say, hey, this is illogical, or hey, this is a problem, or people are having these experiences, and it's actually at the benefit of the church itself, the institution itself. It used to have agitators, it used to have people from the outside in and the bottom up to organically help it grow. And so there's gonna be this odd hammer on attack. It's gonna be that I work for Satan and stuff. And I'm like, why is it that all throughout Mormon history that every time somebody complains about something of the way that it was, and it's not like that anymore, you can count a list of people who are excommunicated, a list of people who were called, you know, agents for Satan, that now in 2023, the things that you are happy changed about the church are because of those people that were once called agents for Satan. So it's just this big, long, illogical way of saying like, Satan has myself, but he doesn't call a lot. I'm not contracted by Satan yet. I just do this for the people, the people like me, who uh, needed help piecing things together when their life felt like it was falling apart because a lot of the true things, a lot of the things that they just assumed were true, assumed uh, made logical sense. The more life experiences they had, the more people they met, um, the more books they read, the more ideas they were exposed to, they suddenly could not fit these two ideas anymore. And it was uh, a real pain point. And finding their way out of that and trying to grow into a new life of their own that they lead by themselves without an institution telling them what a good life looks like, what type of marriage will make them the happiest, what type of lifestyle should make them the happiness, uh, one prescriptive way of how human beings should live. Going from that into trying to take back their autonomy from the church, realize where it was given away and where it was taken, and then developing the critical thinking skills to not be bamboozled again hopefully and feel like you own your mind you own your body just like Stephen Hassan has been talking about that when you recognize there are these tools of undue influences these mean these uh, these manipulations on your mind to get you to comply with something that otherwise you wouldn't comply with that there are sneaky conniving types of argumentations that work on our human psyche in all different types of religions all different types of cults all different types of, of uh, uh, political arguments all over the place. Just like generally speaking as a society, just smart enough to be like, hey everybody quit it, I know what you're doing here. That's that logical fallacy that doesn't hold water, right? So I'm gonna end on a fun one. So this guy underscore beige 10 commented one night a couple, a couple days ago, nose emojis on my Instagram. And you guys, you're so sweet. You don't need to say a single thing. Beige, you could just send me like a house emoji. Send me like an emoji of a house and that would help me remember that I need to clean mine and that I will get off the internet and go do that and stop making videos. Cause that's, that's actually a good twofer. Like you get bang for, you get more bang for your buck with a house emoji, to be honest, Mormon trolls. And that one can at least be sexist and true. So it's, it's a lack of creativity as is typical of these online interactions. Somebody says, you're doing this. You're just, you're just, what do you do? Just waste your time tearing down this perfectly innocent, never done a wrong thing, adorable, cute, like a baby chicken, beautiful, innocent organization. And so me and Samantha do find this argument really interesting. It comes up a lot. I was a conservative four years ago and there are a lot of words that I use now that when people use them when I was a conservative, it was like a it was like a dog whistle in a bad way where I was like, mm, they said heteronormative. They said a word with three syllables or something in it. 
and you just project that like, I don't know what those things mean and they're actually quite over my head, but I think I know a lot of stuff and so if they're saying things that I don't understand, they don't understand them either. So uh, Samantha replies with this, this nice beautiful reply you can pause to read there's just this projection when people do not understand the arguments that people who like me make criticisms of the lds church and its culture and its doctrine um uh, the place that we're coming from and instead this ad hominem and this confirmation bias that i know a lot of stuff um about the church and what they're saying over my head doesn't make sense that must mean that what they're saying is just a bunch of gobbledygook that doesn't make sense to anyone. So if this may video made sense to you, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, please make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. I try to put out new videos every week. It's been fun. It's been amazing. I have some big, big projects coming up as well soon. And I am sweating to death in this professor's cardigan that I stole out of Samantha's closet. And the only reason that I haven't taken it off yet is because I get the I get the comment too often <laughs> that uh, yeah I'd uh, pay attention to a lot more what she said but uh, her cleavage really inappropriate and distracting from her overall message. Uh, I noticed that Kara every once in a while promotes sex toys and while she might argue that having a healthy happy sex life. Uh, is part of the deconstruction from a uh, like toxic purity culture religion. While that may be her argument, she could not possibly make any coherent points in the aftermath of just like dildos flying all over. So I just gotta say that's a you problem, that's not a me problem. I'm hot right now and the sun's coming in. So if you like this video, I want all of the comments in the comment section. I really try to read every single one because I can make a part two. I can make a part 25 to this about uh, logical fallacies within the context of Mormonism. Uh, I really am just getting started. So if you like this video and you want to see another one, please let me know. If there is just like five extra dollars in your wallet, every little tip makes a huge difference. I do try to make this my job. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. And it's really nice to know that by me showing my shoulders and 2% cleavage that everything I just said is now irrelevant and unacceptable to a certain subsection of the population where the words coming out of my mouth and the points that I made are now irrelevant because they are superseded by the skin that I'm showing. That's a really fascinating thing about humans. Like you guys are wild.